Hey everyone, with the release of the draft of the Orc license, I wanted to take a few minutes to look at the current licensing models that are out there for some of the more common games, and then see where the Orc license fits when compared to these. In particular, I'm curious if the Orc license accomplishes the goal of actually being an open license. Now, I'm not going to look at every single tabletop role-playing game out there, but I think I've got a good sample with some of the different options that creators have. As always, I am not a lawyer, so if you are unsure about something that you are working on, please do consult with a professional. And be mindful that what creators are doing and what is officially authorized by a license is not always the same thing. First of all, I think it's important to define what an open license is. I looked up some different definitions of open licenses, and there are several different variations. They all seem to have the same general principles, so for the purposes of this discussion, I decided to go with the Creative Commons open license definition. And you can see on this page, it defines an open license as one that requires an attribution, but otherwise lets people use the content in any way, including commercially, only requiring them to share their modifications under that same license. This is the so-called share alike portion of this. It particularly mens out, it mentions that the free license in this does not necessarily mean that the content has to be free or that you have to be you you don't have to do a royalty what it really is just referring to is that you are free to use the content um, but you might still be charged royalty so just because a a creator is charging a royalty does not mean that it's not an open license uh, the really important parts are that you are only having to provide an attribution to that particular content. You don't have to jump through a lot of hoops to in order to use it. And that you also have the share alike aspect so that anything that you modify from that original content, you also share under that same open license so that others can, can also use your, your modified content for their stuff. So that's kind of the two key points for that. With that, I want to take a look at some of the different game systems and let's see where they stand uh, based on that definition. The first one I want to look at is Dungeons and Dragons. And there's a few different options here for fifth edition, as we know from the last couple months. Uh, there are, uh, is the fifth edition SRD that was released under Creative Commons. And the Creative Commons license that it was released under requires an attribution, uh, and that's it. There's nothing else you have to do. It does not require you to do the share alike. So you could just make your content and not actually release your stuff under Creative Commons. So it doesn't fit that second definition of what an open license would be, uh, but it definitely fits the one of an attribution. There's no ho hoops you have to jump through. You just put the attribution there and you're good to go. The open game license version of it is similar. It allows basically the same. It actually includes a reference to uh, doing a share alike where you could share your stuff under that open game license as well, but it doesn't require it. So it's maybe, maybe a little bit closer to being that true open license, but it doesn't uh, include, it doesn't force you to do it. So you just have an option. Uh, in both cases, you just have to provide the attribution. The open game license one does require you to actually include the license in your document as well, which maybe is a good a little further but but that's it there's no registration you have to do there's nothing like that you just have to put that in the document and you're good to go uh, naturally with the creative commons release there's really not much reason to use the open game license version of it for fifth edition because the creative Commons one is much easier to use uh, much simpler to to understand as well so um, but those are both pretty open licenses there there there's uh, there's no royalties involved uh, or anything like that so from a fifth edition perspective they fall into the category of being pretty close to open certainly with the uh, creative commons version of it now there's also another version of the fifth edition license because those licenses only allow you to use the system reference document, which is a very uh, scaled down version of the core rules with some of the spells and some of the monsters and magic items and things like that. Uh, it doesn't have everything for D&D. It's just a, a core set of things. It's not even everything out of the player's handbook or anything like that. Whereas if you wanted to publish something on DM's Guild, then you get access to additional stuff. You can pretty much use anything within the D&D space. You can go to any of the D&D books and use that content in your own content. 
The trick with this is you can only sell it through Dungeon Master's Guild. You do have to have an attribution in the sense that there is a logo from DM's Guild that you have to put on your content. And then you can only sell it through DM's Guild and you have to pay a 50% royalty for any sales of that product. But you do have access then to pretty much anything in the D&D space for 5th edition. Uh, you can't use the artwork, but you can you can set it into in Forgotten Realms. And uh, I think you can even use some of the other settings as well. So you get a lot lot more stuff that you've got access to, but you do have that royalty and you are limited to selling it through DMs Guild. But it is another option for 5th edition. Moving on to other versions of D&D. So 3.5 obviously uses the open game license. This is kind of what started all the fiasco a couple months ago. And this is the license that's been around for more than 20 years. When 3rd edition came out, this license came out with it and along with an SRD. And it's very similar to what we have for 5th edition is there's an SRD. And then this license allows you to use that content for your stuff. It does restrict you to the stuff that's in the SRD. It also does not include anything that forces you to do a share alike. You could just uh, use your content and then not share your content or make it open to anybody. Uh, there is just the attribution and you have to include the license. So very exactly the same as what you have with the fifth edition, if you're using the open game license for that. Um, and this one's been around for 20 years. It's worked very well. Um, as we found, however, is that it is not irrevocable. Uh, it doesn't say that it's irrevocable on here and clearly they were trying to revoke it. So that uh, makes it a little less open because they could change their mind at any time. And, and then that would put everybody in a bad spot. So, but that's what you have for third edition slash 3.5. Fourth edition is where it really starts to get locked down. I, I had some trouble finding an actual copy of the fourth edition game system license. Uh, there's some out there, but they're not formatted very well. So I didn't really want to put those up on the screen. Uh, but this is an FAQ from back in 2009 that kind of goes through some of the key elements of the game system license for fourth edition. The trick with this one is that it is not open. It's it's kind of considered open, but the the trick is with this one, if you were to publish something using the fourth edition stuff, you would have to one, get approval from Wizards of the Coast in order to to do it, which they're not going to do now, obviously, because it's not the a valid uh, version anymore. And you would also have to stop publishing anything that you were publishing under different licenses. So at the time, if you were publishing content for version 3.5 under that open game license, you would have to stop publishing that content if you wanted to publish fourth edition content using this license. So that was uh, one of the things that made fourth edition not very appealing to content creators. Uh, it makes it pretty much where you can't develop fourth edition content. So it really locked it down. And uh, that's one of the struggles with fourth edition. So it definitely goes on the other end of the scale, much closer to the closed side of the of the scale there uh, for fourth edition. Now, while I'm on the subject to finish out for D&D, so anything that's prior to third edition of Dungeons and Dragons doesn't have a license. There were no open game licenses for versions for second edition or first edition or any of those variations of it. So. Uh, because you would have to have a license in order to grant permissions, if there is no license, then no permissions have been granted. So anyone that is creating content for second edition, first edition, basic, whatever, uh, that, that content is not actually licensed. So you can probably get away with some of it because some of that stuff is pretty similar to what you had in 3.5. And so that is covered under the open game license. And so by making some tweaks to the rules that and, and the mechanics that wouldn't necessarily be copyrightable, you can kind of get away with some of that. But you do have to be aware that if you were trying to use something that is very specifically from, say, basic D&D, uh, or, you know, the old advanced D&D, then you might have an issue because there's not actually a license that allows you to use that content um, for, for anything else. So be mindful that anything older than third edition, there is not actually an official license available for that product. Moving on to the next one, we get to the Cypher system. And this one was interesting. This is Monty Cook Games, and they actually have a very open license. This one falls very close to what you have with the Creative Commons license for D&D 5th edition and the SRD. Uh, you are allowed to use the uh, Cypher system reference document, and it basically says that you can use uh, the content of this in any way that you want and you can sell it and you can even include the compatible with cypher systems logo on your work. 
Uh, there is an attribution that you need to provide, which is typical of an open license. There is no share alike clause in here that I could find. So it doesn't look like you have to share your modified content uh, with an, as an open uh, license as well. But, um, but it definitely is very simple. There's not a whole lot to this. It goes into some details about not using their other stuff. You can only use the stuff from that SRD. You can't use stuff from other books. And um, so there are a few restrictions to it, but you don't have to um, jump through any hoops to, to do it. You just put, you, you can uh, put that compatibility logo on there. And uh, you, as long as you stick to what's in that system reference document, you are all set. So, and they even have some additional details about uh, what you can use. And, and there's, I think there's an FAQ in there somewhere as well. So, uh, so that one is actually pretty open. So Cypher Systems right up there with the D&D uh, fifth edition uh, Creative Commons release that we have. Next one on my list is Paizo. Paizo has a few different levels to their stuff. So the first thing is their community use po policy, but you can see very clearly, uh, it's only applicable to non-commercial activity. So everything on this page and what you can use only pertains if you're putting together products that are not going to be sold. Uh, so if you have a website that you have, that you have free access to it, and it's very clear that that free does not mean just free from pay payment. This includes anything where people, would, there's a paywall or anything. Those are all would be considered commercial use. So that would not fall into the category of this. So they're very clear about what they consider um, commercial activity. The couple exceptions that they have are you are allowed to have sponsorships for your content. Um, you're allowed to accept donations. You are allowed to use the stuff if you have a, a YouTube channel and you're getting ad revenue. That is that is acceptable. So this this uh, where it turns into commercial is if you're actually making a product that's going to use the Pathfinder system reference document and you want to sell that product, then you can no longer use the, the, uh, excuse me, the community use policy here. Uh, so there's a couple places in particular where it says that this is only for commercial use. And it points you to, if you want to use any of the Pathfinder stuff for commercial purposes, then you have to get a Pathfinder compatibility license. And that is a different page here. And what this does, this is, this starts to get very similar to what we saw with DMs Guild is there's a logo that you get to use and you have to uh and you're restricted to a certain materials and at the bottom of the page here if i scroll down there is a list of the books that you're allowed to reference and so you can do that and there's also some stuff that you can get as far as the formatting for your content that you can use. So, and that's what you're restricted to use uh, if, to get this compatibility logo. The trick with this one is that you also have to register it. So uh, there is a email address that you have to submit your content to and, and then you have to uh, send them updates to it. Anytime you do new content, you have to send your stuff in and keep it updated. Uh, and there's a timeline for how often you have to do that. So um, a little similar to the DMs Guild uh, where you have, you can only sell it on DMs Guild. So you, uh, that's basically registering it when you submit it to DMs Guild. Here, you're sending your product into uh, this. Uh, there's an email address, I believe on here. So uh, there's no royalty associated with it. Whereas DMs Guild is taking a 50% royalty, but they also are not offering any sort of marketplace for you to sell your content. You still would have to sell it wherever you uh, would be able to sell it at other places. Uh, so there's a, a little bit of uh, both. I think I put this probably on par with about what the DMs Guild thing is. You do get a compatibility logo. You have to put the attribution on it in the, in the form of that compatibility logo, as well as the open game license stuff. Uh, there is a registration process, just like with DMs Guild. Um, they don't have a royalty, but they also don't have a marketplace. So um, roughly the same as about DMs Guild. Fairly open, just a, a few strings attached to it that you just have to be mindful of if you want to go down that road. Next, I have uh, Call of Cthulhu. Uh, this is Chaosium, and I'll actually flip over to his, this one. They have uh, this Miskatonic repository, which is a partnership with Drive-Thru RPG. And this one really, I feel like we start taking some steps down to more closer to that closed side of the scale. 
Uh, if you read through all this, what you see is there's um, a lot of restrictions. They take a 50% royalty. Uh, you can only sell it through this on drive through RPG. You can only use this, the uh, version seven. Um, that's not really so much an issue with the with the license. It's just you know, versions one through six of Call of Cthulhu are not licensed. You have to use version seven. Um, the uh, there is some stuff that you can use as far as the the artwork and stuff, but uh, you do have to register it, and and it does have to go through kind of an approval process before you can actually sell it. So you can't just sell your put your content out there and sell it. You do have to go through a sort of approval process. So uh, I would definitely put this one closer towards the closed end because of the fact that there are more restrictions on what you can do. You cannot just make the content and just put it out there and sell it. You have to sell it through a very specific place. You have to actually register it. You have to get it approved. So there's a lot of restrictions on this one. So for from a Call of Cthulhu perspective, definitely put this one closer towards the closed end. Next one is drive through, uh, excuse me, Dungeon Crawl Classics. Uh, this one, they they have a very, uh, as typical of Dungeon Crawl Classics, very lighthearted sounding page talking about their licensing um, and how it is open. And they even have this compatibility logo that you can put on your stuff and there's no royalties or anything. Uh, however, uh, it's not truly open because you do have to submit to them and they have to approve it. So you, uh, if you want to get do anything for Dungeon Crawl Classics, it is not just simply you can uh, use their rules and then make content and sell it. Uh, you uh, you do have to register. You do have to get approval. And so there are uh, there's stuff on here that makes it not open in accordance with the definition that we had looked at earlier, where you just have to do an attribution. So it definitely goes beyond that. Um, I, I don't know how difficult it is to get something approved because I've never tried to do that, but um, I would not put this in the category of being an open license because you do have to get that approval. Uh, I put Cobalt Press on here because they do have a compute community use policy. Now they don't actually have a rule set yet. These are their content is all adventures and monster manuals and magic items and things like that. Th until Tales of the Valiant comes out, they don't have a rule set that you know that they are gonna that would be licensed. Um, and obviously they've indicated they're going to use the Orc license for that. Uh, but they do have a community use policy. Um, but it's very clear that um, non-commercial. So you are allowed to use their stuff. If you have a place that uh, you want to put some information on there, you can use this for non-commercial, but they are very specific about what they consider commercial. And if they get any hint that you are doing something that would be considered commercial, they will terminate your agreement with them on this. So you uh, you need to be very careful. They are, they are definitely not open as far as commercial use of their content. They do have some stuff down here where you could submit uh, to get a uh, product approved to use. But again, uh, you, you would have to register it with them. You'd have to get approval from them. So most definitely Cobalt Press, not open for their stuff right now. They, uh, you can use it for, for any free stuff. If you're, if you've got a website you're running, that's perfectly fine. But if you're trying to do some commercial stuff, there's uh, definitely, definitely not open when it comes to that. And the last one that I looked at is Shadow Dark. This is obviously one that is new and is currently in Kickstarter, and uh, they've made it very uh, clear that they are going to be open with it. I looked through their third-party license, and it's very clear right off the bat that you can use this for free and you with no royalties. Um, and you can use the there's a, you can say that it's compatible. Uh, you can't use the art in there, but you can actually reference stuff from the book. Uh, so very much all the stuff that is uh, going to be make it that would make it open, put it right up there, probably with similar to like the Cypher system and and even the Creative Commons for fifth edition. Uh, it is open, very simple. It's just one page and goes through it. It does not have a share alike uh, phrase in here. I don't know if that'll be something that'll come later. Uh, since that is kind of important as far as the uh, open licenses are concerned. So, but uh, that's not in here now, but it might come later, but it is definitely uh, very open. So when it comes to the open licenses, I think uh, the fifth edition SRD under Creative Commons, very open. Shadow Dark, very open. Cypher Systems, very open. I think those are the top tier the next level down would be really your Pathfinders, uh, your DMs Guild, and um, 
Uh, that's probably the the three point five would probably fall um, somewhere in there as well. And then you start getting into the ones that are more closed, and and that would be your call to lose your cobalt, your um, fourth editions. Uh, those are definitely more on the closed side. So um, so there's some that are pretty close. Um, but now with all that said, that's kind of where we are now. That's what the the role playing game uh, content creator landscape looks like. But now we have this orc license. And so I was reading through the orc license to kind of see. And the natural question is, why would they need this orc license? Why not just use the Creative Commons? Uh, and I, I saw some stuff in there talking about why, um, you know, Creative Commons is a very generic license, whereas we're talking about a very specific type of content. So having a license that's more geared towards that type of content makes sense. And I don't have any problem with that as long as it accomplishes the goals. And I think in reading through this, again, not a lawyer. So, you know, the, the legal folks would have to look at it more closely. But there's a few things that jump out at me that are that are nice. And, you know, it has the watermark on there. So we got to it's a little hard to read. But the, uh, you can see that it, you get a royalty-free, uh, non-sub-licensable, non-exclusive, irrevocable license to use the content that is specified as ORC content. So right there, they've fixed the issue with the open game license by actually saying that this is an irrevocable license and it's royalty-free. Uh, so this is very similar terminology to what you had in the open game license, but it does add that irrevocable phrase to it so that this cannot be taken away once it is put into place. Then the next section is our share alike that, we've, that we were talking about where this, this whole paragraph here that I'm gonna have trouble trying to highlight here, but is about you needing to offer any modified content as also open content. So if I was to take a, uh, say a cobalt from that's been designated as orc content from another creator, and I was to make my own graybeard cobalt using that as a guide and build that cobalt, then because that is a, is a derivative of that other content, I would then be required by this license to release that derivative content also as orc content so that other people could then use my graybeard cobalt in the same way that I used the original cobalt. Uh, the, the nice thing though is that it, I, it's not all or nothing. If in that same document, I was putting together a, a graybeard thingamabob that is a completely original content for me that's not derived from anything else, I would not have to release that as orc content. That one I could maintain as proprietary content and would not have to release it. The same with it. if there's artwork in there, I don't have to release everything. So I do get to specify the only requirement is, is anything that I derived from someone else's orc content, I also have to release as orc content. So that's a, a nice piece of licensing to have to ensure that we all as a community can benefit from the work of the entire community. If I benefited from somebody else, it's only fair that I give it back to the community to use as well. And that's that's kind of the key things in here. There is an attribution section. It's a relatively small attribution on the surface. Uh, it, it gets a little complicated if you were to be pulling content from a lot of different sources because you do have to provide an attribution for all the different things that you are using. And so every time you used a monster or a magic item or a location or something that was made available as or content, you would have to provide an attribution to that original creator. And there's a very specific format you have to use. I could see that getting kind of unwieldy if uh, over time, if uh, you have a lot of things that you're you're putting in there, you might have several pages with that. So maybe that's something they streamline in the future releases. But at the same time, you know, if you are using all that content from these other creators, I think it's fair that you might have to dedicate a few pages to giving credit to those creators for the work that you're borrowing from them. So I don't necessarily have an issue with that. It's just, it is a lot that you might have to keep track of depending on how much of that stuff you're using. And that is pretty much where we are with the landscape. I think I think the Orc license is a great way to standardize the content licensing that we have out there. You could see that as I went through all those other ones that there was a lot of different variations of what you had to do and what kind of licenses you were being granted. So 
all of these publishers that I've talked about, with the exception of Dungeons and Dragons, have indicated that they are going to support the Orc license. So um, I think that's a, a big step forward because it would standardize it across all of them. And as long as they follow through on this, then it could really be uh, an excellent thing for the the industry, all the third party creators, because we wouldn't have to be juggling all the different rules that the places have. We would simply be able to say, you know, hey, if they use the Orc license, then great. I know exactly what I need to do. So. I think it's going to be a boon for those companies that are going to use the Orc license because it, people are going to gravitate more towards them. And if someone such as like GURPS or something decides they don't want to use the Orc license and they just want to do their own license. So that's Steve Jackson Games, I should say. And I'm not sure if they've signed up or not, but let's say that they decide they want, they're just going to do their own thing. Well, as a creator, I might be more willing to go and sign up and do the Cobalt stuff or do um, do something with uh, the Monty Cook games or with Shadow Dark because I know what that licensing is. I don't want to have to learn a whole different licensing scheme or have a bunch of other hoops I have to jump through because this other publisher doesn't want to use the Orc license. So I can see it really shifting some of the things around of what kinds of content you get out there. And I'm, I'm really interested to see what those next steps look like. Um, it, it'd be interesting to see what that next next draft is and how this all plays out. So it's it's really interesting to me anyway. But let me know what you think. Um, this is uh, just what I see right now. I I think the Orc license is actually leading the pack when it comes to being truly open, even even kind of getting ahead of where where D and D is and and some of their open stuff. I think because it's got that share alike in it, that's great. So, but let me know your thoughts down in the comments. I would love to hear from you as always. Until next time, take care.